You're still watching the Breakfast on Plus TV Africa, and we are going to straight to the dailies, and uh, we will be starting with um, leadership. And Mercy, you have the first paper. All right, of course, and shortly afterwards, we have Femi Lawson join, joining us uh, to make sense of all of the headlines this morning. Okay, let's look at the leadership newspaper this morning and find out what big stories are making it. On the front page of the leadership newspaper, you find pressure mounts on President Mohamed Buhari to sign Electoral Act Amendment Bill. Uh, that's on, uh, what you find on the leadership newspaper. I'd like to take that again. Pressure mounts on President Mohamed Buhari to sign Electoral Act Amendment Bill. Governors, lawmakers, lobby president. Uh, this is some of the riders you find. Civil society organization orders make case for assent. Say bill reflects people's will. President has 27 days to OK bill. And another rider says, interest of Nigerians should be paramount. Uh, that's what lawyers are quoted to say. Moving away from the board caption, you also have operational issues delay use of 180 billion naira customs vessel at Lagos Jetty. It's another interesting caption you find. And below the leadership, you also find Ami vows to treat bandits as terrorists. And you have AGF DSS deny seizing El Zazaki's wife's passports. That's also another caption on the leadership newspaper this morning. FCT teachers vow to continue strike. Sit at home order over in Southeast, or Hanazes, quoted to say. Best basic education to get 3% consolidated revenue fund. Uh, this is some of the uh, caption on the leadership newspaper this morning. All right, away from the leadership, we'll uh, move on next to the nation uh, newspaper. The banner headline for this morning is still on the Electoral Act Amendment Bill. And the, the nation captions it this way, I echo with President's action on Electoral Act uh, with the riders uh, there. APC governors meet on direct primary, ACF chieftains urges Buhari to sign bill. Above the masthead, Nigerians stranded abroad over expired passports. And of course, just beside that one, prosecute illegal vasty operators, a fair Babalola tells the NUC. All right, Fidelity Bank launches uh, Fidelity for You campaign. Uh, that's also above the masthead. Other stories on the nation this morning. Uh, Malami DSS, uh, El Zagzaki's passport not in our custody. Other stories uh, this morning on the red strip just below the page. No more seat at home, says Ohanese. Doctoral degree for accord day. Those are the stories you can find on the front page of the Nation newspaper. Away from the Nation newspaper, we check out the Daily Independent. and The bold caption reads, FX woes would limit economic growth. Investment, that's what analysts quoted to say affects effectiveness of reforms elsewhere in the economy. You also have, amid slow passenger traffic, Nigerian Airways invest 1.29 trillion Naira in aircraft acquisition, and 25 additional brand new airplanes expected in 2022 and 2023. Stakeholders differ on indigenous carriers and huge investment. Fire incident destroy properties worth millions of Naira in River State. And you also um, find another caption saying, United Kingdom Base Save the Children appoints Otedola Vice President. And direct primaries, APC governors in last minute move to stop electoral bill ascent. Might just be dominating all of the papers this morning. Parties should decide mood of primaries to adopt says Sagi, and you also find sit at home other, go about your normal businesses, or Hanese tells Southeast residents. Now this is some of the uh, headlines on the Daily Independent newspaper this morning. All right, away from the Daily Independent, we'll move on next to the punch. The main headline for this Monday morning, 90 ships seized by the EFCC rot away in Lagos, others with two riders there. No budgetary provision for Navy to maintain seized full-feated ships. Some of the vessels being managed by third parties pay rent to EFCC. 
above the masthead, there are some interesting stories there. Pantomese governorship bid posters, handiwork of ministers, detractors. Okay, uh, more stories on the puncha. Afe Babalala fought NUC's inaction on illegal vasties, says damage huge. Experts blame 2023 elections for 4.1 trillion naira in recurrent expenditures. All right, invading Cameroonian rebels came by boats. That's according to Taraba Community Restaurant. You can find that on page three of the punch. Federal government rehabilitates 15,000 terrorists, 366 soldiers, policemen killed in two years. There's a story on the blue strip above the masthead. Short-term loans, others push banks' assets to 58.51 trillion naira. More stories on the Front page of the punch this morning, uh, 19.3 billionaire saga. Kogi alleges EFCC doing hatchet job, issues 48-hour ultimatum. Family bids ransom to 10 millionaire for Jonathan X8 brother, seven victims rescued. Carry out your normal activities Monday, or Hanese tells transporters, Others. Those are the stories you can find on the front page of The Punch this morning. All right, we have uh, Femi Lawson, who's uh, on standby this morning. Femi Lawson, thank you so much for joining us. Well, good morning, my pleasure. All right. Uh, let's start off with the leadership newspaper, and this might just be dominating all of the papers. Uh, pressure mounts on the president to sign the Electoral Act Amendment Bill. What are your thoughts? Well, uh, it's, a, it's a good one, but I don't think it is at this stage that we need to cut mountain pressure or appealing on not the president to sign the amended electoral bill because uh, if Mr. President himself, just like he has repeatedly you know, said, is committed to the credibility of our electoral system, to a transparent and a more, you know, credible election in, in Nigeria, he should, without any further delay, you know, sign this amendment that the uh, National Assembly has done upon the Electoral Act. It is important because without credible elections, which is aided by the electoral bill, you know, we may not be making any claim you know, to the advancement of our democracy, particularly under the administration that has been severely accused you know, of manipulating and interfering in the election of so many instances. So I think it's important, but even in the absence of President Buhari, realizing the urgency of this. Remember, by next year, we'll be having governorship election in Osho and the Kitsi State. So, if the president does not see the urgency of signing this bill, the civil society, the media, and Nigerians at large must really continue to mount pressure on President Buhari to do the right thing. All right, uh, Mr. Lawson, another, another um, headline that caught um, my attraction, uh, this, or my attention rather, this morning is that of the seated home order uh, in a uh, most um, part of the South is Ohanese Ndibu is asking residents, uh, you know, to disregard and saying that there's no longer any of such in, uh, you know, hold and sway. What are your thoughts specifically? Well, it is good <clears throat> when you consider, you know, the economic implication of this seat at all on the South East State since it began. But the question we must ask ourselves this morning is that was it our Navy that declared the seat at home in the first place? And does it really have the power to call it off? Today is another Monday and I think today will determine if truly you know our Navy has what it takes to uh, tell the people of the South East that there's no more seat at all. Even when IPOB came out to issue statements, you know, canceling the seat at all, you must understand that there were, you know, issues around the legitimacy 
of those who made that declaration. And that is why the seat at home has persisted. So our uh, neighbor can conveniently say there's no longer a seat at home in the southeast. But the truth remains that we must look forward to the people obeying the position of our, our neighbor or not, especially when it is not our neighbor in the, in the first place that declared the seat at home across the southeast. But the most important thing for us is that both our neighbor and the government and also stakeholders within the region should once and for all sit within themselves, even before meeting the federal government, you know, and discuss issues around the cancellation of Mazen and the Kano and other issues that have necessitated this seat at home order and look at how they can collectively address it rather than I will be making statement today, our neighbor tomorrow, state government next tomorrow. There is need for a collective uh, approach to addressing this issue that is you know, really affecting the economy of, of the southeast. All right, let's just stay with the leadership newspaper this morning. Quite interesting caption. It says, Ami vows to treat bandits as terrorists. <laughs> It is a, I, I don't know if we actually you know, need to keep reminding these people that uh, this category of people, they have consciously continued to de you know, define and describe as a bandit, are actually terrorists, and I don't deserve any less treatment. So I don't think it is a promise that the army should be making, especially when nothing, nothing contradicts the fact that these guys are terrorists the way they operate. You all witnessed what happened and not cannot be there yesterday. And you cannot tell me that these are mere activities of bandits who were, you know, who used to be cattle rustlers, you know, who sometimes just kidnap people and but these are not these are pure terrorists that have, you know, practically taken over, you know, and suppressing the livelihood of people, particularly in the Northwest region, and, and of course now moving downward to the south. So we don't need to continue to embark upon this rhetoric of if they are terrorists or not. The government will be courageous enough to classify them as who they are, and of course deal with them squarely as terrorists. All these, uh, you know, promises by the army leadership and the presidency are not really encouraging, especially to the people who are daily under the the the, you know, the hostage and tortures, you know, and harassment, killing, and otherwise of these uh, terrorists in this part of the country. Okay, so, but do you have an idea why um, this group of persons have not been, I mean, proscribed terrorists? I mean, in your um, analysis this morning, you say that the mode and pattern in which they operate, I mean, there should be tagged terrorists. But why has the president not proscribed them terrorists, the terrorist group? I think this can uh, just be one reason that is best known to the president and the operatives of, of the administration. For a group that has uh, made life very unbearable, that have been killing security agents of the state, the killing citizens, and of course, taking over certain territories of the country, like we are witnessing in Sokoto, in Niger, in Katsina, in parts of Kaduna today. Only a few days ago, the governor of Niger State came out openly to say that two local governments are under the complete control of these guys that we keep calling bandits. So all their actions have confirmed that this is a terrorist organization expanding this, you know, capture of our territories. But because the president 
just like I think, think if we if they are declared as terrorists, it may require more, you know, firepower and military approach to face this guy. And maybe the administration is not willing to do that yet. Mm. Must be the reason why the Nigerian states have not categorically declared this invading, you know, group as terrorists. But as far as some of us are concerned, and especially those who have been victims of the activities of this gang, they are nothing but, you know, pure terrorist groups, and they don't deserve any other thing than the treatment given to terrorists. All right, uh, Mr. Lawson, uh, let's uh, flip um, to the Punch newspaper. It's a banner headline this morning. 90 sheep seized by EFCC rot away in Lagos, others. That's a whole lot of economic loss, if you ask me. What are your thoughts exactly? Mm, it, it, it really tells that, uh, you know, there's total lack of interagency cooperation among not only our anti corruption agencies, but our military and paramilitary organizations and our government agencies. If you may ask, even if these ships are suited by the EFCC, is it also part of the function of the EFCC? Or does the FCC have the capacity, you know, to maintain and service ships? But these are not items that can be told or kept in the offices of the FCC, like vehicles, you know, documents, cash, and other properties. These are, you know, assets that must be serviced as required, that requires even some daily maintenance and routine, you know, operational checks. For well, good that they were seized for economic act, uh, reasons or you know, financial atrocity reasons by the ESCC. Does that mean that we should just abandon them on the waters and let them rot away? Then, of what benefit does it become to the nation and even the agency that is, you know, responsible for the seizure and, of course, possibly prosecution of people who are involved? It tells you that we need to do more than. This, you know, fire brigade approach of who we have arrested, we are prosecuted. We must go to the extent of working with every other stakeholders to make the anti-corruption war a holistic one. For God's sake, if you really know what it means to have even 10 ships on the waters in Lagos, you will know the economic importance, you know, and what it is, what it actually is to also have, not have 90 ships rotting away, you know, in Lagos, not, produce, not giving any economic benefit, possibly being even maintained or, or being, you know, being, being secured, you know, with taxpayers' money. So it is a wake up call that when there are issues, when there are seizures like this, the ESC should be able to work with agencies, you know, like the Navy, you know, like a the, you know, the Port Authority and, and the relevant agencies to make sure that these ships are not only, you know, anchored on our workers, but are also made, you know, to be useful and effective, possibly to, you know, by securing orders of the court and get them functional or disposed, rather than, you know, what we are witnessing as an eye saw, you know, in the name of seizure by the UFCC. All right, uh, the EFCC is still in the news, uh, staying with the Punch um, newspaper, Mr. Lawson. Uh, the 19.3 billion Naira saga. Kogi is a legend. EFCC doing hatchet job. Issues 48 are ultimatum. Femi. Well, where the, it is truly controversial, especially when, when you realize that, you know, the, the EFCC, and accused Kogi State government you know, of we are rousing this fund in a bank. They went ahead, secured a forfeiture order. Now, this money has been sent to the Central Bank of Nigeria. But I think we need to ask fundamentally if this fund, as claimed by EFCC, is an illicit fund has been illegally, as it claimed, diverted by some officials of the Kogi State government. Should that be the end of the matter? 
if truly I see SEC claims that these funds were meant to pay salaries, you know, of workers and it was not used for the purpose. And now you have you know, returned it to the, the CBA. Now, does, does it mean that nobody is going to be made to face the law for diverting, if truly, almost 20 billion naira into you know, secret account? You see, I sincerely know that nobody signed documents opening that account, ordering that so called diversion or whatever. So I think as much as people think Kogi State government have questions to answer over this uh, controversial 19 point something billion naira, I think the yes, ESC have more questions to answer now about how it came about that investigation, that report, and why nobody, not a single person, is being prosecuted now. It is beyond just getting money, finding money in account and sending it to CBS. I think it's, in, it's time that uh, these people stop playing with our, you know, sensibility as Nigerians. If truly 20 billion was found illegally kept, like you claimed in an account, some people must have done that, irrespective of how early placed they are. Are they in court? Are they being prosecuted? Then who owns the money now? As that you have, what, what, where, where is the position of Stanley Bank in this? Because this money is said to have been a loan. Who pays the money? Is Kogi State tomorrow going to pay the money it never spent or that you, of course, send back to the CBN? So there are more questions than what has been answered by the ESCC. And I think the ESCC has a lot to answer around this issue of uh, Kogi State, uh, like for something billion Okay, let's move on to the issue of direct primaries. Looking at the Daily Independent newspaper this morning, uh, top corner of it says, direct primaries, APC governors in last minute move to stop electoral bill ascent. Now, Saga is also saying that uh, parties should decide mode of primaries to adopt. Uh, what do you make of this? And because it feels like the quest, it feels like the reason why you have the APC governors lobbying the president and you know, lawmakers lobbying is so solely because of the issue of direct primaries that is part of the bill. You know, you know remember we have said it here on a number of times. I think it is one of the, you know, the steps taken by the National Assembly, and it's a self-serving proposal on the part of the National Assembly to begin to determine the mode of primaries for political parties. I think we should have left this just like the opinion of most Nigerians in the hands of political parties to determine their mode of primary. You see, this, uh, this idea of using the privileged position of being legislators to create laws to suit personal ambitions and purposes it's not in the interest of our democracy. Of course, we understand why some of these governors are also G3, because even in the past, a lot of them have not also done well in the manner and approach that they have become overlords, you know, and almost become a sole administrator of the political parties in their state. But the truth still remains that the political parties should be left alone in deciding their mode of primary. What is suitable for party A may not be suitable for party B. So it is not really fair for a group of people to sit using their privileged position as lawmakers to impose a mode of primary on political parties. I think uh, that was an unnecessary proposal. I call it a busybody proposal because uh, it's an attempt to use first ambitions to impose on a particular will on majority of the people who are members of different political parties. But do, do you see Mr. President tilting towards the APC governors? I mean, yielding to their requests? Is it the, uh, President Boy is one of the most unpredictable human beings you can actually come across. Irrespective of what the pressure may look like on the part of the governors, the truth is that you can, express, you can expect the president to do 
whatever, I mean, like it, please, is conscience. Like we have experienced on a number of occasions. If you look at it today, President Buhari is the reason why the Catholic Committee is still in charge, you know, of their political party, despite the opposition by so many stakeholders within the party. So it may be difficult to predict what the position of the president may likely be. All right, uh, before we uh, wrap all of this up now, another story making headline on Daily Independent this morning. Amid slow passenger traffic, Nigerian airlines invest 1.293 trillion naira in aircraft acquisition. Do you see these as um, some good news for the industry? Do you see uh, a lot of things um, happening with this acquisition, Mr. Lawson? Well, uh, it's good, especially for a country that is uh, striving to economically advance, you know, attract foreign investment and the like. But uh, it is not enough when the atmosphere is not made conducive enough for these operators because it is easy to acquire a good number of aircraft, but how much more is the aviation authorities, you know, doing to ensure that you know, the operations of these airlines, especially when you talk about taxation and every other burden that they have to carry, you know, becomes more friendly, not only to encourage local participation, but to also encourage, you know, foreign investment in our aviation sector. And if you look at it, even though we claim that uh, there's a low passenger traffic, but the reality is that at some point there's a surge in passenger traffic because of the security situation in the country. A lot of people have abandoned and are abandoning the roads and are opting for air travel. And that's why you find airlines expanding their roads almost on a daily basis. So I think it is not out of place for the sector to have gone this far in acquiring more aircraft, but the most important thing is that we need a government that will also ensure that these investments yield profit, you know, and they do not end up, you know, as bad investments for both the local and the foreign uh, investors in the sector. All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Lawson. Uh, but more stories that uh, we need to look at. Uh on uh, the dailies uh, this morning. Okay, uh, experts blame 2023 elections for 4.1 trillion naira rise in recurrent expenditure. How does that hit you? Mr. Lawson, are you still there? Yeah, can you come again, please? Okay, another story on the front page of The Punch uh, this morning. I just want us to just talk about it briefly. Experts blame 2023 elections for 4.1 trillion naira rise in recurrent expenditure. Okay. Yeah, so what, what's your take? <laughs> the truth is that uh, we would continue to invest this much, you know, on our elections, not even directly by government, but if you look at, you know, the financing of election in Nigeria, you realize that a lot of uh, people who are in charge, especially the policy makers, you know, the people who ordinarily should also work on the proposals to make sure that they become more people friendly and reasonable are all you know, adding, deleting, and adding to the content of our appropriation bill to ensure that you know, each constituency, each interest group gets you know the larger part of the cake, and that is why you realize that a lot of projects that they end up becoming self-serving or those that seek to promote you know the ambition of people in power today are now infused into the, you know, the, the government expenditure. So
So in truth, you cannot you know, divorce the realities of the coming election from what is being seen now as you know, government expenditure because personal interests and ambitions are becoming infused into the public spending, public expenditure, and until elections have become less tricky, until uh, our election gets to the point that people do not need to go and take loans or, you know, do pass to short cuts, and uh, that we are able to also legislate genuinely on the limit of election funding in Nigeria. People won't stop, you know, kind of putting this burden of their personal ambitions on our collective, uh, you know, expenditure as a country, just like we are currently witnessing. All right. Uh, many thanks, Femi Lawson. We have to, you know, wrap it up at this point in time. We do appreciate your time pleasure. this morning, and uh, we look forward to sharing more of your thoughts on some national issue as we proceed in the course of the week. Yeah, thanks right. for your time. Thank you. Many thanks for joining us. Once again, we will uh, definitely step on the brakes. And of course, the rest of the breakfast will continue with today's history. Please stick around. We'll be right back.